The following content is provided under a Creative Commons license. Your support will help MIT OpenCourseWare continue to offer high-quality educational resources for free. To make a donation or to view additional materials from hundreds of MIT courses, visit MIT OpenCourseWare at ocw.mit.edu. So we're going to talk about uh, crypto exchanges today, which very much relate to blockchain technology, but is not directly an application of blockchain technology itself. But it is so much a part of the ecosystem of crypto finance, with well over 90%, and in some crypto uh, currencies, 95 to 98% of the actual transactions happening on crypto exchanges. So I thought that no course in blockchain technology and money could really be complete without talking about crypto exchanges. Um, but I, I wanted to dare say uh, not to be looking throughout these uh, talk today and even on Thursday when we'll also be talking about crypto exchanges with some outside guests about where are we lowering the cost of verification or where are we lowering the networking costs. This is about basically the secondary markets in this $200, $200 billion ecosystem. Um, and the first crypto exchanges came about actually in 2000, late in 2010, I think it was, but it may have been early 11, because just when there was one blockchain application, Bitcoin, people wanted to move Bitcoin. It was like, well, how can I do this? I can do it with another individual on a blockchain. Uh, but there was even, how do I find that other individual if I want to sell it or exchange it? And so there was a business opportunity. Uh, Mt. Gox was one of the first three or four. I don't think it was the, literally the first one, but it was one of the first uh, handful that started to take off. Um, we'll talk about Mt. Gox that failed. Uh, dozens, if not hundreds, failed early on. Um, but they were trying to provide a user experience to trade initially just solely Bitcoin. Bitcoin versus fiat. Uh, was really what it was. And it was providing also uh, a service to people that were not as technologically uh, adept as some of the MIT uh, students. So I was going to ask again and by a show of hands, uh, how many in, in the room have ever owned a bit of cryptocurrency or something like that? Just to, all right. So it's a third to a half. But you'll see it's going to be a Far fewer, even in this MIT community, have done that directly on the blockchain, a blockchain as well. So is it Aline? Anybody else? So of the 30 hands that went up, the other 29 basically have done it through a crypto exchange. So they provide a service right there. Now, there's a central irony that Satoshi Nakamoto's uh, impetus, the motivation, uh, that we've talked about was how to do peer-to-peer -peer movement of value on the internet without central authorities. This failed attempt throughout the 90s that finally uh, uh, he or she solved that riddle in 2008. Here is a decentralized way to move value around the internet. And here, even at MIT, the 30 or so of you or 40 of you that have owned a crypto asset but one of you. Now, this is Sloan, and it's not computer science and AI class. Uh, but I suspect even over in the computer science class, it would be less than half actually have gone and downloaded the nodes. Um, because there's a convenience factor. It's human nature. Um, uh, and, and, uh, and so that even started in 2010. So I wanted to talk a little bit about crypto exchanges, uh, some of their challenges. Um, uh, and some of the uh, opportunities. And it will set up also for Thursday's discussion where we'll be talking about how a crypto exchange might be used for a payment solution and how an entrepreneur like Jeff Sprecher really has looked at and said, no, this is where he can see value. You will hear Thursday somebody who is uh, true to his <laughs> entrepreneurial skills is trying to find value in this whole blockchain technology Bitcoin world and has chosen a kind of a mixture of a payment solution and a crypto exchange or both. Um, well, this might not be 
uh, tied in, so I'll do it the old-fashioned way. Um, so we're going to talk, uh, of course, the readings, crypto exchanges, a little bit of the public policy challenges, and then uh, my thoughts on path forward. Where do I see the crypto exchange space uh, um, moving forward um, uh, in time? So Tom, you get to answer another question. How have crypto exchanges become critical gateways for? Yeah, I mean, so obviously the usability, the interface, and we've talked in previous classes about how many people have downloaded digital wallets and other um, versions of crypto exchanges to just facilitate. Right. So let's go to the other side, because Aline was the one hand that went up that you've downloaded nodes. Have you ever used a crypto exchange, if you're willing to share? So you've done both. Yeah, in Coinbase, I bought some Bitcoin, uh, and then I transferred some on my computer because I, I was doing a research project, and I thought I was going to use it for the research project. I ended up deciding that it's too valuable to for the research project. <laughs> <laughs> I, I use it. Right, right. So if it were 2018 now, and you were to transact in Bitcoin, would you prefer to use a crypto exchange or the nodes that you've, just Bitcoin? I guess it depends on the security goal. So if I'm paranoid, I'll use a note. I want to send money to my mom. I'll use Coinbase. That's neat. Your mom uses Bitcoin? No, but surprisingly, she's, she's quite open to it. She's open to it. OK. So even somebody who's computer literate and has both the nodes and the exchange is saying, depends on how tired I am and what my goals, securities goals. You, maybe you didn't say tired, but. Um, uh, and, and um, anybody want to hit the second question? Yeah. Yeah. Uh, which type of disputes then? Right. And 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 how do how do uh, these exchanges compare to traditional exchanges? So the New York Stock Exchange. How does how does uh, Coinbase compare to New York Stock Exchange? They must have some kind of like um, reserve or device. On So you're saying they have reserves. I mean, I don't know if it's called reserves, but like, if you buy from Coinbase, right? You don't buy from another user. Ah, so Coinbase itself. So one change difference, uh, and I'm going to highlight three and see if we can get off from this discussion. One is the exchange itself might be on the other side of the transaction from you. Uh, uh, Alexis caught that, uh, that they had a reserve. Some might call that market making. Um, I'm sorry? Yeah, I think another difference is that crypto exchange, it forms responsibility as a broker. So they face the customers instead of facing Right. Them. So a corollary to what Alexis says that they might be a market maker, remind me your first name again. Johnny. What? Johnny. Johnny. Uh, is that uh, they take on brokerage responsibilities. In, in the world of finance, on uh, on uh, trading platforms, trading platforms by and large early on did not allow the, the public to transact. The New York Stock Exchange, when it started in the late 18th century by an arrangement between members in the south of Manhattan, you know, near Wall Street, the physical Wall Street literally, um, it was a membership society or a membership club, and you had to be a member to transact. Well, those membership and clubs, just like a golf club or a tennis club, had a set of rules well before governments got involved, um, and they would transact. That became what, what is now known as intermediated access. That, that I, I don't think any of you are members of the New York Stock Exchange, are you? I'm not either. So we can't actually transact with the New York Stock Exchange, but we can use an app like Robinhood and ask them to transact with the New York Stock Exchange or Goldman Sachs or Vanguard or you know whom. 
So that's called intermediated access. So two things we've had is one is Coinbase might be the other side. Two, there's, they, don't, they lack intermediated access, Eric. They don't store the value that's being created. Right. In the regular exchange, the Coinbase actually stores the cryptocurrency. Right. So uh, Eric says the third big difference, I mean, there are other differences, but the third big difference is crypto exchanges store the value. The New York Stock Exchange did not store the value. The, your value is technically, ultimately, on a ledger at the Depository Trust Corp, DTCC. And just like the payment system has the central bank and commercial banks, securities ledgers have a central ledger, which is DTCC in the US and in other countries, other similar clearing organizations. And underneath it are the brokers that hold things, it's called in street name. But whatever it's called, know that most exchanges, traditional securities markets, the, those are the three big difference, custody, intermediated access, and who's making markets against you. Please. Maybe just a question I have is, from a crypto exchange, every transaction needs to be backed by the, by the coin, right? So if there is a collateral, if I sell the coin, I must have owned Whereas in a derivative exchange, you can just issue a trade without owning whatever, or just a promise so we can create uh, volume. Well, so you're raising a question of the difference between cash markets and derivative markets, which exist in, in, have existed for a couple hundred years, so that in a cash market, you're selling an ownership right and buying an ownership right in a stock, in a bond, or even in Bitcoin. And then in derivative markets, you're, you're entering into a contract, uh, or sometimes people call them contract for differences, but a contract that's going to relate to a, a price, a pricing mechanism from some uh, 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 oracle, it can be called. In computer science, they would call it an oracle. Uh, but in, in the commodities market, by some index provider, or some pricing provider. That's the differences between cash and derivatives. But I are you saying something even in addition to that? Yeah, because I was going to get to the point that I launched the Bitcoin contract. Right. And I haven't gone deep into that contract, but it seems to me it's, it's a derivative, not cash as a traditional right. contract. Right. So I, I ask you all to go as deep as you can between now and Thursday, because you'll have the founder of ICE with us. But ICE is a one-day futures contract that literally you're buying a derivative of Bitcoin, but it's a very unusual futures contract because it has to be 100% collateralized. So there's no margin. There's no ability to have leverage or debt or credit extension. And one day later, you get delivered the Bitcoin. So one of the interesting questions for Thursday that you can press Jeff and Kelly on is, is this really a derivatives contract, or is it a form of a cash contract that just starts as a derivative and 24 hours later it becomes cash because it's 100% collateralized and it settles one day later? Very unusual future contract. I'm not aware of any other one day future 100% collateralized contract. It, it feels to me that this is, in essence, a cash contract by another name for one day that facilitates being regulated by an official regulator for derivatives. That's for that one. Um, but I, I thought you were saying one other thing is, can you uh, sell short Bitcoin? Does anybody, uh, Sean? Sean has shorted Ether, Bitcoin, and Bitcoin Cash. Bitcoin Cash. So how'd you do it? Well, there is, uh, it's not Coinbase, but it's with uh, some app that you can use uh, that allows you to short. Yeah. Shorting is selling something you don't own and, and, and taking uh, the opposite price risk. In essence, winning when a price goes down and losing when a price goes up. Um, and it's existed for hundreds of years. It's not new. But it, to short something in most markets, you need to be able to borrow the underlying. 
to sell a stock that you don't own. Um, there's a whole market called stock borrow where ultimate, and we debated this one day, and there, there are experts in this room that have wo worked in stock borrow, where you borrow the security and then you sell it. Or you sell it, and within the two days that you have to deliver it, your broker borrows it for you. So I'm assuming, Sean, that when you shorted Bitcoin, the, what was behind that app, somebody borrowed it. Um, and, and so just to, to move to the third question. So three big differences, and we're going to dig into these. Custody, intermediated, broke, you know, basically, do you have an intermediary or are you direct? And uh, is the exchange a market maker? Um, uh, what do all the hacks and manipulation and so forth tell you about the state of security at these? and the state of market integrity. Makes the crypto exchange insecure and uh, less trustworthy to the banks. And things is less trustworthy the financial institution or mainstream financial Yeah. So, so in essence, that regardless of where you come out on pro-regulation or anti-regulation or, or pro-business or anti-business or pro-Bitcoin or anti, it's a question of trust. When you're losing a lot of assets to theft, and a hack is just another word for stealing, um, uh, or you're losing money to market manipulation, then that tends to have you know, lower trust in these institutions. Now, we can debate what to do about it. I, I publicly have a point of view, and I'm going to share it with you as we go through this class today. But you don't need to share the second part, which is where I am on how to address that, to recognize that the high level of, of custody issues and the high level of market manipulation issues uh, probably is associated with lower trust in these institutions. Even now, there's you know, 30 million plus people that have used crypto exchanges and 30 or 40 people in this class. So there's, there is a level of trust, I'm just saying. I think that's the, 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 what's really at the middle of this. Um, so let's have, so we had a bunch of readings. I'll skip over that. Um, so crypto exchanges. So this is what a centralized exchange does. There's about 200 of them probably in the history of Bitcoin. There's 100 to 200 that have already opened and shut. You know, so somewhere in the history, there's been three or 400. It's still pretty darn decentralized in terms of the number of them. Um, and I'll later say, I think one of the things that will happen is we'll see more consolidation. There's just so many of them. That's an unusual market structure. Markets usually coalesce around some central pricing function. If you want to buy and sell your apples hundreds of years ago, you'd come into the center market if you wanted to get the best price discovery. So, so, so the question is, do we have so many crypto exchanges in part because of lots of different regulation? I think that contributes to it. I would say um, yes, but I don't think that's the only reason. So you're saying traditional exchanges, there was the, especially for physical goods, apples, there was a locational advantage of being in the central square. I agree with that. There was locational advantages to be in New York or London. Do you know in the 19th century, the Philadelphia Stock Exchange was bigger than the New York Stock Exchange until about the 1840s or 50s? Post-Civil War, New York took off compared to Philadelphia. But there was locational advantages. But in a digital age, there's less location educational advantages. I, I agree with that. Um, I also think it's a very early days in some regards. It doesn't take much. There's one software provider that provides the software for over 100 crypto exchanges. They're not the biggest ones, because some of the biggest ones write their own software. 
but it's uh, the, at least the CEO that told me this, who runs the software company, said that it was over 20% and maybe 30% of the volume. So half of the crypto exchanges, about a quarter of the volume, all have the same software, meaning the software for the order book, for the, for the, for the custody solutions and things like that. You too could start a crypto exchange. Please be compliant with securities law uh, if you're going to operate here in the U.S. Well, actually, if you're going to operate in any country, um, but particularly in the U.S. Um, so it's not hard to start up. That's one other thing. It's not hard to start up a crypto exchange right now if you've got a software provider that can give you uh, basically a package and you put a new name on it and off, off you're going. Um, but they're matching agents, meaning they're matching buys and sells. They are also counterparties, which we talked about, and they're custodians. Traditional exchanges do the first, but they tend not to do the second and third. Decentralized exchanges. Decentralized exchanges are a very small part of the market. We'll see some numbers later that estimate it's a little less than one half of 1% 1 of the volume right now in October of 2018. <clears throat> But they're a computer algorithm that allows you to trade peer-to-peer -peer without a centralized. Uh, and there's a lot of variation in the decentralized space, and I'll take any questions on it. But it's, it's an interesting piece where it's saying, Kelly and I don't really need Coinbase to trade if there's some application that can find e each of us and we can find each other. Ross. Decentralized exchange is, if I understand what you're saying correctly, centralized, but only for the matching agent function. Very good, correct. Right, and it just doesn't have the other two because you can just right. trade. Right. If you have the so Ross has raised are decentralized, uh, really centralized for matching, uh, and don't have the other two. Let me answer it in reverse. Decentralized exchanges do not have any custody function. No custody function. Though I could envision that somehow they could set up a decentralized escrow function through some multi-sig. You could technologically even do that decentralized. But what I know now is none of them have a custody solution, and none of them are counterparties. That, that is accurate. <clears throat> it's not clear that all of them are centralized. There's one developer. There's one set of computer technologists. But you can actually, if you wish, put that algorithm out and just say, that was a fun project. I'm a computer scientist at MIT, and just put it out there. And Kelly and I could find each other. But usually, there's an economic model where somebody's trying to make some money. And so then there's some centralization of the software. And the SEC just brought their first uh, legal action last week against a decentralized exchange. And it was, in essence, against the software developers. Now, there's the First Amendment. Don't get me wrong. There is clearly a freedom of speech and freedom of expression in this country. But you could be a software developer and still be complicit in some crime. And both the SEC and CFTC have, in the past 12 months, brought in legal actions against software developers. And it's interesting that in the last week, uh, the SEC, they settled. It was sort of a thing where uh, Ether Delta uh, um, uh, had put a decentralized trading platform for, what do you think the SEC is most interested in? What, what type of, what's that, ICOs. Catalina? ICOs? Yeah, so it was a decentralized platform to trade Ethereum-based, more specifically, ERC-20 tokens. Decentralized, Elon and I could trade our ERC-20 tokens. But this, they said, no, no, that's a securities exchange. Um, so it was, and it's the first action the Securities and Exchange Commission has brought against any crypto exchange. Why they picked it decentralized to be their first, that's a story I don't know, but they did. Um, so that's decentralized. It's less than half percent of the volume. But an interesting and tough you know, new area. And it, it brings you back to maybe Nakamoto more vision decentralized. Um, so as I said, 
responsible, just like in this classroom, for probably 95% of the Bitcoin and Ether uh, transactions. Who do you think the biggest uh, sellers are on, in Bitcoin around the globe? What's that? Miners, right. Miners. Who do you think the biggest sellers of Ether F is? Anybody? ICOs. What's that? I see. What'd you say? ICOs. ICOs, yes. Because ICOs, 80% of ICOs are done on Ethereum. And generally, in the early days, they were selling a token for Bitcoin. When Vitalik Buterin did his, and he sold ETH for Bitcoin. But we've moved in the last 12 months, it's basically selling for ETH. So then you've, you want to sell it, um, generally speaking. I mean, they might keep some. Um, over 30 million direct members. And as we talked about, they lack intermediated access, and as we'll see, market integrity rules. So this is you know, the market as it is. <clears throat> the most important part of this slide to me in this discussion is not the volatility, which we know. And frankly, actually, recently, we haven't had much volatility for six months. But six months isn't enough statistical relevance to say what the next six years or 60 years will be. Um, but 54% is Bitcoin. Ethereum is, uh, what, 16%, so between them, that's 70%. So we already know in the US and in many other jurisdictions that three quarters of the market are not ICOs or not what would be called securities, even in the US, Canada, and Taiwan, the three jurisdictions that follow something similar to the Howey test that we've talked about. Three quarters of the market is, is non-securities, it's just a commodity, a cash crypto. Um, so you'll hear debates about initial coin offerings and what's a security and what's not a security. Relevant, relevant and important debate. But for three quarters of the market, it's not particularly relevant as a legal matter, as a regulatory matter. Brodish. I have a question. So if Bitcoin is to become a stable value cryptocurrency, then what is the relevance of an exchange? If it is not an asset, what is stable value currency? So is, Brodish, is your question that if, if, if there's limited volatility, what's the value of, a, of an exchange? Um, the value is still is that some people will want to sell that asset or buy that asset. Some people might, if it's a store of value, I might still want to sell that store of value so that I can buy a car or go to school or pay for my medical bills. You don't think that's as exciting as a volatile asset. Is that what you're saying, Brodish? Well, at Goldman Sachs for years, it used to be that I was taught volatility is our friend. When you're in investment, investment banking business and making markets, a market maker likes volatility. <clears throat> um, so you might be thinking as a market maker or as an investment banker, but I, I still think that, that if Bitcoin or any of these became very stable stores of value, um, people would still want to trade in and out of it. But you're, you're saying it's just less exciting for, for you or for the market, you think? For the market, maybe. I don't have any Bitcoin. Oh, OK. I don't either. Um, so here are the top crypto exchanges. I caution, this is, uh, uh, was printed a week ago. It's, it's only accurate to say that uh, a, a web group, uh, Crypto Compare, puts, puts out a monthly report. And I grabbed the October report. But I would, there's no confidence that these numbers are accurate, except for I can tell you Crypto Compare has relationships with about 140 exchanges, and those 140 exchanges give their information to Crypto Compare. <laughs> but here are the big ones. Um, what, what do you take from this slide when you look at the, either the average trade side, the trades in 24 hours, the volumes, uh, anything? I mean, has anybody traded on an exchange that's not listed there? If you're willing to say, Elon has, huh? Coinbase. Yeah. Coinbase isn't listed in the top 14. Look at that. For the month of October by Crypto Compare. Sabrina. 
What's that? True coin? Oh, Q coin. I use Polynex. Polynex, which is definitely smaller than this Polynex. I was just going to say as an observation that all of these are domiciled in Asia. There's no US space exchange. So the US space exchanges aren't up there. So we don't know if these numbers are accurate. They are what Crypto Compare collects from 140 exchanges, but it doesn't mean they are accurate. One way they can be inaccurate is an exchange can just outright lie. And if there's no rule or law against it, they can do that. Another way they can do it is they can be honest about the numbers, but inflate the numbers through something called wash trades. Wash trades are banned in the US under securities laws and under commodity futures trading commission laws. A wash trade is when I buy something and sell something at the same time, basically to myself or my affiliate or my colleague. And if I have even, if Elon and I are not even legally affiliated, but if I sell something to Elon and he buys it and we have an agreement that we are just pumping the volume for some reason, that's a wash sale. Why would somebody do a wash sale between two unaffiliated parties? You want to think devious, think like, you know, a manipulator. Yeah, you wanted to make sure somebody else thought something was used. What's the, uh, that's use, another reason? It'll show uh, artificial liquidity in a particular series. So artificial liquidity and one other thing that you might show, an artificial Price, thank you. So wash sales for a long time in markets was a good way for manipulators to kind of, hey, look at this liquidity, look at this price, pricing signals. So that's why in the US securities and commodities markets we say no, it's, 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 a, it's, it's one small core thing that's not allowed, but there's no ban on wash sales. So there's, there's academic literature, there's some studies, some competitors, some, some exchanges study other exchanges as a they have a lot of wash sales over there. So we don't know how real these volume figures are. Um, the other thing that I find interesting is the average trade side, 200 to 1,000 bucks, a couple of them a couple thousand. I mean, these are not large transactions. Kelly. Twenty million accounts. Um, so that's obviously pretty good. I wonder how the other metrics compare to. So I went around trying to find a list of the membership, and I couldn't find it for others. And maybe it's kind of it's a little harder than pumping your numbers through wash trading. I mean, you could also lie about your membership, and even Coinbase's twenty million doesn't mean they're active members. True. Um, Ah, uh, Coinbase. So here's uh, another way to look at it. It's by legal jurisdiction. Same database. Uh, you're going to have uh, eight or ten slides that are same database. Um, Coinbase is in the U.S., and this would say that it was a little less than 140,000. No, I can't quite see where that line comes. Maybe it's 100 uh, million a day. And this is just the month of October, so but that's where. Sean. Um, it's listed there in the Seychelles at 300 Hoibe Pro. I'm not sure why it's not listed on this. It's the same database. It's not there. Yeah, there it is. Number five. Number five. Um, so what would you take around, around this about the, the great financial centers of the world? Yes? Uh, I think one of the questions that I got seen in the previous slide was, if you sum up all the trades that those exchanges are claiming that they are doing on a 24-hour basis, isn't that a lot larger than the capacity of the system itself? If I remember well, there's like seven transactions per second. That All right, so the question is, this looks like a lot more volume that's actually happening. And I'm going to agree with you. Why do you think that's possible? Two reasons. Because they're 
they're just doing the exchanges like internally. They're not actually transacting on the blockchain. Right. Remind me your first name. Jack. Jack. So Jack's point is, well, maybe not all of this is going to the blockchain. It's happening on a spreadsheet, in some cases an Excel spreadsheet. But I'm not aware of anybody storing it even on a blockchain within the uh, Coinbase or Kraken or who buys system. Second reason? Wait, I would say option, but that's so it might be using a second layer solution or a lightning or second layer. I, that's quite possible, even though I'm not aware if there's a lot of activity. Um, third reason, there's a lot of currency crosses here. This is not just Bitcoin. There's probably two to 3,000 different pairs that get traded on any day. Bitcoin Ether, Bitcoin Dollar, Bitcoin Tether, you can Bitcoin, Bitcoin Cash. But a lot of the, the crosses, a cross in foreign currency land is two currencies. It's often called a currency pair. US dollar versus euro, US dollar versus yen. These were currency pairs. But now we can, if we can use the same terminology here, there's thousands of crosses or pairs. So it's not all Bitcoin. But the first reason is the biggest one, what Jack said. Not all of these exchanges will settle to a blockchain immediately. In fact, it's costly, even for them. So they'll take some price risk. And if they have enough um, customers and they're market making on the other side, they'll take some price risk and they might settle to the blockchain uh, multiple times a day, but only settle when they have exposure. And I don't know, their risk management might be, I'll settle when I'm long 10 Bitcoin or short 10 Bitcoin, but take some price exposure, that risk management, in essence, Coinbase or Kraken or Gemini or Huobi are basically saying, I'll take some price exposure and only settle to the ultimate settlement finality, the blockchain, um, several times a day which of course takes 10 to 60 minutes as well. So that, that's happened here. Good observation. Yes, Isabella. So Coinbase talks a lot about how they keep digital wallets off of the network for added security. So yes. do other exchanges not do that? So Isabella has raised that Coinbase uh, promotes that they have a secure custody solution. And part of it is keeping your Bitcoin off of uh, the network. Uh, the term is keeping it in cold wallets instead of a hot wallet. Anybody know what a hot wallet is? Eric? It's software-based wallet that's connected to it. Yeah, software-based wallet that's connected, currently connected, as opposed to a wallet that's disconnected and not signed up. <laughs> Let me hold that question because I've got a slide on that. But uh, yes, the answer is others also have uh, cold storage. Uh, Mount Gox, five years ago, didn't have much cold storage. Um, but what other observation here about the great financial centers of the world? James? They're all tax havens. They're all tax havens. Malta, Binance, and OKX. Now, again, whether the Binance and OKX numbers are legit. Uh, you're Hong Kong, yeah. right? Yeah, you're Hong Kong. Biggest tax haven of China. Yeah, <laughs> the British Virgin Islands, Seychelles. You know, it's kind of, so there's some regulatory arbitrage going on. And these are the countries where they're registered, not necessarily the country of the real operation. Some are, were, uh, Hubei is one that started in, in the People's Republic but in Beijing, but they re-registered uh, elsewhere. Um, you mean you don't know them? Does anybody want to say, Priya? There you go. I'm surprised that you haven't learned about this financial center. <laughs> OK. <laughs> Uh, James is going to tell us more about it and how much it costs to go on an Expedia during SIP week. 
I think Sloan should benefit from a true trip. OK, so this is a different way to measure it. This is not on volume. Uh, I'm going to take a second. This is just number of major exchanges. And there's the eight big ones in the US, starting with the biggest, Coinbase, Bittrex, Poloniex that we talked about, Kraken, Gemini, Itbit. Those are the ones that are kind of US-based that some of you in the US might have. I think on this chart, if you don't find your exchange on this chart, I would be all right, all right, maybe, because it might have already failed, whatever exchange you have. But uh, Eric, who are you looking for? Without this chart, you wouldn't be friendly. All right. These slides are all be on Canvas. I'm sorry, Joe Quinn, you had a question. Um, I was a little bit lost in this, but I have a Bitcoin, and I turned back how it did not Bitcoin on the So what all of the exchanges did very early on this is starting right in late 10 and then 11, they set up a, a account structure, literally on Excel spreadsheets, but an account structure for all of their customers. And let's say that you're buying Bitcoin and Kelly is selling. Maybe I could, I could do that transaction between you and Kelly right on, on uh, uh, this is going to be called the Gensler Exchange right on the Gensler exchange. So I don't need to move that to the blockchain because, oh, one really important thing. What happens when you open an account? I'm sorry, it's a good question. Now I realize I skipped over something. What happens when you open an account at a crypto exchange? Aline? You, do, you might do KYC and AML, but that's not what we're looking for. Would you be issued a key pair? You, what's that? Would you be issued a key pair? Well, you... Uh, you might be, but actually what I'm looking for is what happens to your, I have Bitcoin and I open an account, uh, or I have US dollars and I open an account. I sign a user agreement with them that they're gonna store any of my crypto in their name. Coinbase, Kraken, Hubai, they are not storing it in Alpha's name. I don't know if you have an account, but I'm just using you. If Alpha has an account, he signs a user agreement. He says, when I buy Bitcoin, it's in a, at best, it's on this Excel, well, it's probably better than an Excel spreadsheet, but it's in their database in Alpha's name. But on the Bitcoin blockchain, it's in a bunch of Bitcoin addresses that Coinbase controls or Kraken controls. So the problem of the centralization is gone, right? It has a name tag on a separate ledger. You have some legal rights against Kraken or Gemini. I mean, you, you, you do. I mean, uh, yeah, but I, but I mean it's centralized. It's correct. Right. Okay. That's correct. And so because both of you, Kelly and you, have signed some agreement, they're moving Bitcoin to Kelly and Bitcoin to you, or if you put US dollars in and you're buying Bitcoin, got it? Um, but it's because the market, the customers want it that way too. Um, so uh, decentralized exchanges, uh, again, based on crypto compares, these are the top five in October by volume, but it, these are not the five you read about most. The article that you read talked about others. So I don't have the deep confidence in these, but I, these are the numbers that Crypto Compare could pull together. And you can see they're much smaller numbers. In aggregate, in the Crypto Compare database, it's only 0.4% of the volume. Robin Hill said that they waived the fees uh, in, in, in terms of competition. I didn't understand the business model. Okay. Oh, making so how many of you have Robinhood app on your phones? Yeah, about 10 of you. Do you pay any fees for securities transactions? Remind me your name. Aaron. Aaron, no. Anybody pay any fees to Robinhood? No. Isn't that kind of neat? <laughs> Whoa, you do? You pay some fees? Indirectly. They sell your clothes. Okay, and your name is? Isaac, right. So Isaac's got it. They sow your data and they sow your flow. What was the third thing you said? Float. So I don't know exactly how their like, custody and brokerage works, but I know that there's an advantage to actually having the securities at your brokerage that you can lend against them okay. for 
All right. So three things, your data, your flow, and what Isaac called float, but I could call that they have the securities to, to lend, stock borrow, stock lend. And those are the three ways. How does Facebook make money? They have your data. So we live in a time where, where platforms sell your data and use your data to sell advertisement. I was going to say with Robinhood, you can also pay a premium that's tier to be able to go on margin. Instead of paying interest in the margin, you pay a flat fee. And then they also like advance your settlements instead of taking three days to do it immediately. All right. So there's a premium service where you maybe could get further. They sell your flow. What that means is there are parties that will pay brokerage houses payment for order flow. Vanguard does it as well. It's not, Fidelity probably does, I'm not certain. But many big brokerage firms, when we all work with them, and my account at Vanguard, I have zero commissions, but I know they're selling my order flow. So who would be interested in the data or who is interested in the flow? So Facebook, I understand, would be marketing companies. Okay. So that would target me. But in this case, is it other federal agencies or? Okay, no. <laughs> Who's interested in the data or the actual order flow of financial transactions? Tom? Hedge funds, trading entities. Wait, hedge funds? What type of trading entities? High frequency traders. High frequency traders. So I believe that, um, uh, uh, that Robinhood signed contracts with initially, I think, three and then five high frequency trading shops. And I've been told a number of those names. I don't know if they're public, so I'm not going to repeat them on the camera. But, but big, uh, a couple of them US based high frequency trading shops. Why would a high frequency trading shop pay for it? Daniel? Go ahead. I, I have a question. Uh, why would a high frequency trading shop pay for it? So they think there's some value, Isaac? Or you can front run. Yeah, you can front run, <laughs> right. So anybody who read you know, some of the books on high frequency trading, you can front run, but there's also value, to answer Raheem's question, there's value in the order flow. Because if you can see that the market's leaning just a little bit this way, even for a few seconds, you can optimize your algorithms and make money off of that. And the US equity markets, well over 60% of the US equity markets are trading with high frequency trading right now, any daily volume. In the commodity markets, when I was at the CFTC, some, some contracts, we thought it could be as much as 90%. The S&P 500 futures contract, or the interest rate contracts, very significant. And they, they provide a service. There's a market-making function those high-frequency traders do, and, they, and mostly they do it legally. But there's a value to that order flow. And so payment for order flow is a very critical part of financial markets all the way around the globe and any highly liquid currency market, bond markets, equity markets, and yes, Bitcoin. So Robinhood, Aaron, do you trade Bitcoin on there or do you trade regular equity? Yeah, I can't leave it that way. It's on my phone. It's on your phone, all right. But the one or two times you used it, you had zero fee because some trading house in Chicago has a contract with Robinhood. Um, to do that. And Jeff Sprecher, who you'll meet Thursday, will tell you Robinhood with 5 million accounts now, that's a real threat to the brokerage model. Why, why, why would people of mostly of your generation or millennials, because uh, you're not, you're some of your Gen X's, I think, but uh, I'm a baby boomer. <laughs> I know where I am. But, but Millennials, you get so many services for free. Robinhood saw an opportunity, and they've all of a sudden got five million customers. But that's how they, that's how they, it's a very good question. Um, and so moving a little along, just to give you, so these are the main things from this crypto compare, just in October, to give you a sense. Uh, 
Two thirds of the volume they measure spot, and one third is derivatives. And we're not talking about the Chicago Mercantile Exchange. The biggest derivatives exchange actually in crypto is BitMEX. It has a perpetual Bitcoin swap and a perpetual ETH that has no settlement date. Um, highly leveraged, you can put 1% margin down and 99% borrow. And every 10 hours it reprices. But it's a perpetual rolling 10 hour future. And that's why it's called a perpetual. Ross, I saw you look quizzical. It's made perpetual because it's rolling 10 hour pricing settlements. But you don't settle at 10 hours. You have to either post more margin or receive profit every 10 hours. What's that? Why isn't it just a 10 hour future? Because a 10 hour future might not have you or me continuing the contract. So they created a perpetual rolling. If I don't post, I'm out 10 hours later. That's correct. Yeah. Um, BitMEX is the largest um, in this volume. Um, they say they don't operate in the U.S. because if they did, it would definitely have to register with the Commodity Futures Trading Commission. But whether they operate in the U.S. or not is probably for some other people to figure out. Um, crypto to crypto versus fiat to crypto. 70% of the volume is on crypto to crypto exchanges. Again, we don't know if the volume figures are accurate, but just based on these figures. So the ecosystem is still two-thirds crypto to crypto rather than switching out to some other um, decentralized. We already talked about this. Really important innovation. I think it's gonna, we're going to see more about decentralized, but right now we're still at the early days. Um, Bitcoin versus fiat. This is just the month of October, but 50% was versus US dollar, 21% yen, Korea. Who's from Korea here? Anybody? Do we have anybody? So tell us a little bit about that figure. Why 16% Korea? Your views. I know there's no readings on it. Um, I am not actually sure why, but um, there were a lot of articles about how there are so many people who just put all the money that they have invested over like their lifetime to cryptocurrency because they feel that they don't have any future. Um, like making money, like by working, I don't know, like making the next day. So, I don't know. Any, any other views? Are you from? I think psychologically, a lot of the speculators thought that this was a very even thing to just go speculating on the stock market, where you needed to have some fundamental or technical skill sets, whereas this is just a very pure, pure. Kind of even field. <laughs> It's just pure, up or down. Uh, getting around capital controls. Getting around. Curious still has capital controls? No. There's a kimchi premium, even. The Bitcoin sells for a little bit more, and that's what it's called. Uh, I didn't make that term up. There's a little bit of a premium, and there's some academic studies on, on how that widens and narrows sometimes, depending upon what the government's doing. It's measured in single digit percent, but you might pay three or four percent premium. Sometimes it's one and a half percent premium, but there's a premium on the Korean exchanges. Um, but three years ago, what uh, cross do you think was the largest? Over 50 percent just three years ago. It's not even on that chart right now. Tom? RMMB. RMMB. In 2015 and 2016, over half the market was RMMB Bitcoin. Um, kind of got the attention from the Chinese central bank. And by 2017, that all changed. Um, and the US dollar thing then kind of took that space. And a lot of folks think it's really US dollar to tether to Bitcoin or other ways. Um, this fluctuates. These, these numbers aren't stable. There's some months the yen is the biggest number. Um, we talked about the countries, wonderful uh, financial centers. Um, and then KYC, an interesting statistic. Now, this is about 140 exchanges that Crypto Compare has in their database. And they say only half of them, 47%, observe strict 
know your customer. A quarter, partial, and 28%, absolutely none. Zero. Um, so that's the sort of state of play of crypto. Uh, I hope none of those 28% are operating in the US, but they might be. Um, so what, what are the policy challenges? Uh, one is the markets are readily susceptible to fraud and manipulation. Uh, any market, it's human nature. I don't think we're going to take the human out of human. <laughs> it's going to look for angles, look for ways to make opportunities, even the best meaning folks. If you hold the assets in custody and you might make the markets because you're not settling to the blockchain, even for short whiles, this market model this business model is to make markets, maybe. There's inherent conflicts of interest. There's conflicts of interest in pretty much all of finance, but then we try to manage. We either manage conflicts of interest by certain rules about transparency or certain prohibitions about in the custody world. Banks hold custody as well, but we prohibit them from using your assets unless you permission them to use your assets and things like that. So what we try to use usually is build some system of transparency and, and affirmative responsibilities or prohibitive actions. Those three buckets, transparency, some affirmative responsibilities, and prohibited actions around conflicts. But this space has the conflicts without much of those three things, transparency, either obligations or prohibitive actions. Um, so inevitably, I think it's human nature. You're going to have some you know, kind of games going on. Um, the custodial arrangements we talked about, uh, big challenge. We're going to see a little bit more about that. Complying with anti-money laundering at KYC and implementing tax reporting. In the U.S. at least, in the U.S. brokers have to report to the government when you buy and sell something. This is, was not true 30 and 50 years ago, but we've come to a place where I think it was in the last 15 to 20 years, laws changed. Maybe, Ross, maybe you know in your legal work. But laws changed where brokerage houses have to report, and, and, and those reports go into the US government and other countries. So the brokers say, uh, James sold this many shares of this, and it had a basis of that, and there's more tax compliance. Here, there's no broker, so it's hard to attach something. Um, and um, some of the exchangers are rather uh, uh, slow when the IRS comes knocking. Coinbase and the IRS had a little uh, uh, kerfuffle, <laughs> I'd call it, when the IRS asked for data on their then 13 million customers, and they settled because the IRS was bringing an action against them when they wouldn't give them any information. And they, they settled and gave them information on their 10 or 20,000 most active accounts. But for a while, right now, the Coinbases can act like they're Swiss bank accounts. I hope, is anybody from Switzerland? All right, then I can say it. But, but you know, for decades, wait, who? No, I'm not Swiss, but I live there. You live there? Well, what did, for decades, maybe centuries, Swiss bank accounts be known for? Secrecy. 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 That was their... They're, they had a lot of other good things going on, but that was one of their marketing points, secrecy. Um, it's a little harder now, but it's still relative to a German bank or a French bank, probably a little bit more secret, right? Yeah, it's less a lot because of US pressure now. Right, yeah. right. It's still more secret than some of the European stuff. Yeah, but crypto exchanges are still thinking, oh, well, how can we give up secrecy because competitively other exchanges aren't doing it? So I think Coinbase was trying to be good citizens, but also not give everything to the IRS they IRS wanted. Um, there's a big question of what's a security, what's a commodity, what's a derivative. And in, in every legal jurisdiction around the globe, securities exchanges are regulated pretty much in every jurisdiction. So what is a security and what's not a security does relate to what's currently regulated under current law. I've testified in the US Congress, and I'd say regardless of that, 
if it's even just a commodity, like Bitcoin and under US law is considered a commodity, you probably want these exchanges regulated. And if it's a derivative, in most jurisdictions, it also is regulated. So the first and the third in that list, securities and derivatives exchanges are regulated. In most jurisdictions, commodity exchanges are not, but not at all. So the definitional thing also relates to what comes in. So in the US, there are a number of exchanges that will, I would predict in the next 18 months, register with the Security and Exchange Commission as broker-dealers under Regulation Alternative Trading System, Reg ATS. But I think that they will only do it if they're, they're category one. They have a bunch of initial coin tokens that are so clearly securities, they register. But what if you're only trading Bitcoin, only trading Bitcoin and F and so forth? Those might say, I don't want to have all those added costs. So question for Thursday is, why did the Intercontinental Exchange create a one-day future, which appears to be like it was like walking into it and saying, I want a regulated exchange as a business proposition? That's what it feels like to me. That, that was sort of part of that decision set. But you can ask on Thursday. Um, tracking beneficial ownership. <clears throat> We've tracked beneficial ownership in the securities markets for a long time, from the first joint stock companies, because you track beneficial ownership to ensure that somebody gets their dividends and if they're voting on once a year on the board of directors and things like that. But somewhere in the last 30 or 40 years, law enforcement agencies said that's a good way to track against money laundering and track against other things. So layered on top of securities laws, law enforcement agencies around the globe said, we want to know who owns what. For the prior 50 to 100 years, it was just securities law that cared about tracking beneficial ownership. But there's some international treaty, I can't remember the name of it, that says all securities regulators have to do something extra and make sure that there's transfer agents and there's this whole regime of keeping ledgers of who owns what. In addition to this anti-money laundering stuff, securities laws have, have this embedded in most jurisdictions. This is a tough one for this space, not only because it comes from a libertarian basis, but it's also a tough one just technologically, just, just the technical solutions. The crypto exchanges, half of them have what crypto compares as a strict any money laundering, but a quarter don't have any, which means they're not tracking beneficial ownership. I think that will, that will slowly get ramped up, but um, if you see a lot, of, a lot of registered exchanges leaving one country for another, they're probably going to a place that has lower regulation. Um, oh, and how do you remediate a non-compliant exchange? There's a bunch of exchanges here in the US that will register. Securities and Exchange Commission can do, uh, uh, look, we're not, gonna, we're not gonna fine you, we're not gonna give you penalties for the past, can you just come into compliance in the next 12 to 18 months? That's probably what's gonna happen. But like the Ether Delta situation just last week, they come to some settlement, they say, you've been violating the law for the last X number of months, but how do you come into compliance? And so that would be an interesting sort of what level of regulatory forbearance um, will, will there be. I think that at some point in time, there will be fines and penalties. But I think in, in the US context, they'll bring a half a dozen or eight or 10 into, into regulation and then they'll They'll bring down a, a heavier footprint, bring down the hammer, if you wish, in 2019 or 2020. I don't think that's gonna be in 2018. Kelly. So maybe this is a question for Thursday, but what is the thought on the side of the exchanges? Do they think that there will be a huge cost to them to come in compliance, or are they, do they think that they're gonna lose members, or maybe even it would increase because it's so, so a, a very good question. What does being 
compliant with some broad public policy norms do? And I think there's probably different business models. If you're an incumbent like NASDAQ, and there was a brief article when Adina Friedman, who runs NASDAQ, said she wanted to be in the space. If you're NASDAQ, if you're CMA, if you're Deutsche Börse in Germany, if you're ICE, you really uh, already know how to be compliant. It's probably advantageous to be registered and for all those startups to be registered. In some ways, it creates a barrier to entries, but you, you want to do it. If you're a startup, you could go one of two paths. So Gemini here in the US and Coinbase, at least publicly, are saying, we want to be compliant. How do we get there? Coinbase may be because now they're almost like an incumbent. And so they might want to keep the, you know, the next round of startups out. Um, but I think around the globe, uh, there's no doubt that it would raise costs. The question is whether it would either secure your market share or flush out some competitors. I would contend that it would increase the overall size of the market because more people would be interested. But some fear that it would shrink the market because once you, if you had um, known beneficial ownership, if you tracked beneficial ownership for 100% of this market, some worry the market would shrink. That, that's from a commercial concept, meaning like if, if you're tracking beneficial ownership. Question, Raheem. Why do you think that the whole essence of Bitcoin and all of this is deregulation, being away from the government, um, and have transaction between individuals without any regulation? So it's more libertarian uh, view of exchanges between individuals. So, so the nature of your question is, isn't Bitcoin and crypto about some off the rails, libertarian, pro-libertarian, Peer to peer. I think it's Genesis. Eric, you want to answer? Yes, please. Uh, there's a comment in the reading about Coinbase where the CEO mentioned the fact that more and more people with that libertarian point of view are constantly reminding him that he's kind of betraying that ideal. But come on, we, we don't have to blame him. That. I mean, he's, he's trying to make a business out of it. So being compliant with that is actually trying to broaden the base of customers and make their business yeah. more profitable and, and grow. I, I think that uh, to go from a $200 billion market to $2 trillion or $10 trillion, <coughs> it's got to come inside the public policy envelope. Uh, I just don't see particularly lowering the risk of manipulation and fraud. Then you're going to have a broader uh, societal acceptance and investor protection matters. But, you know, there are others on the other side of that. These are on the numbers. I'm not going to stay on it, but this is just to say <clears throat> one thing crypto comp compare does is average daily visitors versus their volume. Coinbase's average daily visitors is, uh, you can see that a highest red chart compared to their volume. They probably have legitimate use. The two, uh, ZB and EXX, almost have no visitors and they report a lot of volume. So it's just an interesting statistic to sort of say, like, you know, and it might well be that Binance's volume statistics are accurate. Uh, they're just a crypto to crypto exchange. But they also, their ratio of visitors to volume is very different than Coinbase. Um, it, just to give you a little flavor for the craziness out there. Um, investor protection. I sort of said investor protection is critical. Uh, we're going to talk about this in, in, in a week or so about initial coin offerings, but it's further than consumer protection. Um, and importantly, because we address, we know, we are honest, we're earnest about it. We say, yes, there are conflicts of interest. How can we address conflicts of interest? You don't ban conflicts of interest, but you sort of say, is there ways to manage it? How do we promote market integrity through transparency and rules of anti-manipulation? So it's kind of those, you know, the realities of humanity. And then we say, well, how can we sort of put some traffic lights and speed limits in the system to uh, give people confidence to drive the roads? And by the way, Raheem, I can't tell you because I wasn't there around the debates in the 19-teens and the 1920s, but you can be assured there were debates in, 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 in whether to put the first traffic light out, literally, you know, whether to put the first crosswalks. 
And do traffic lights and crosswalks restrict the use of automobiles? Absolutely. Absolutely. But think about this. Do they promote the sales of automobiles? And I would contend they also promoted the sales of automobiles. <clears throat> that simple regulatory intervention meant that people could feel a little bit more safe dr having their neighbors drive, because most people didn't drive, <laughs> but having their neighbors come down past their you know, walking on the street, the pedestrians. Pedestrians felt safer. So I think it's a bit of both. All right, I, I might you know, be disclosing my point of view. <laughs> I think investor protection bolsters investor confidence in capital markets and that everybody benefits. But there's, you know, you gotta get the balance right. And I'd respect if half of you say, no, it should be less regulation, and half said more. I just, I'm disclosing where, where I am and at least the logic behind it. Um, you know what the Howey test is. We'll come back to this in a week when we do initial coin offerings. Um, but that's in the center of crypto exchanges. It's an important issue as to which crypto exchanges have an ICO token. And then they've got to kind of do a little bit more. Um, Hacks. These are the biggest hacks I could find. These are reported hacks. Who knows what's not been reported? <clears throat> CoinCheck and Mt. Gox, each about a half a billion, a couple of 50 to 100, 200. Um, and here's a bunch of tiny ones <laughs> that I put. I mean, they'll be on Canvas, but there's a bunch of basically steal somebody else's coins because they're all. Uh, earlier question. Cold storage and is again uh, thanks to the friends at Crypto Compare. Isabella, that was your question earlier, right? So I can't really tell you why Bitflyer only has 80% in <clears throat> cold storage. And some of these others like Bitfinex is 96 or 7%. But I think that if you have a high volume and a high flow, you can maybe keep more in cold storage, or if your model is more about custody than transactions, you could have more in cold storage. You do need something, you know, probably connected to give your, your customer base liquidity, and somewhat depends how long it takes you to move something from cold storage to hot storage. What's that? So they're self-insured. And Gemini announced that they just signed a contract with Aon, one of the world's largest insurance companies, to insure against loss of that which they're having custody. But don't confuse it for 100% insurance. The insurance companies are charging significantly, somewhere around 1.5% a quarter. So there's some crypto exchanges which will allow you to pay for the insurance. And Gemini says they've signed a contract with Aon, and I can't quite tell whether that's just because Gemini is going to pay for the insurance or they're going to allow you to pay for the insurance in that custody uh, solution. Um, let's see what else. Oh, we're almost wrapping. So here's what I think. Custody. I think the custody duties either have to be fixed or spun off. I think from a public policy perspective, they're better spun off. And that's because there's such an inherent conflict. I think if you're holding somebody's funds and also transacting, it's just too sweet a honeypot, not just to be stolen, but for the operator to say, I want to use it in my own, uh, you know, lend it, borrow it, transact around it. But I, that's my thought. Fix it or spin it off uh, uh, would be the custody. Um, illicit activity. I, I think we're going to have to get to a place where, if not 100%, close to 100% are actually complying. And if a quarter of them aren't even doing AML and KYC, we st there's still a lot of, there's some road ahead here. I know it might not fit Raheem with, you know, the libertarian soul of the, the genesis of all this. I won't say where you maybe personally, but, uh, um, but I, that's, I think that's going to be the path forward. If we're still two and three years from now, a quarter of the market not doing it. I think that the market integrity piece is the toughest one, and it's maybe where my own personal view shouldn't cloud my judgment. My own personal view is we need market integrity, anti-manipulation, no front running, things like that. 
<clears throat> but realistically, it's probably going to be done by individual exchanges or self-regulatory organizations, Gemini and others. In the UK, there's some self-regulatory organizations. I don't think that's sufficient. It's a step really in the right direction, but I think somewhere if this gets bigger, it needs to be the official sector putting some traffic lights and, and, and um, stop signs in. Um, registration and remediation. First, to determine whether you have to register and then comply. And that's a multiple peer, month or year period. In Japan, they started registering in late 2017. They started with 16 and another 16. Some had to shut down in Japan. South Korea is registering. Now, some of those registration regimes are really just about Custody and Bank Secrecy Act. They're not going as far as I would like to go, which is into market integrity. But I think you're going to see a bunch more jurisdictions, registration, remediation, some closing, and the like. Uh, margin and fee compression. I think that's inevitable, whether it comes from the Robin Hoods or the Intercontinental Exchange, but the juice is so much right now. I mean, some of these are charging 1% to 3%. You all transact. You know your fee structure is better, but I think there'll be margin and fee compression. Um, and I think there'll be some consolidation. There's not enough room here for 200 plus exchanges. Uh, um, so those are my predictions. And I think the decentralized exchanges, once they have enhanced customer UI, there'll be more adoption. They're right now not that easy to use for most regular people, <laughs> the non-computer scientists. Um, two questions, and then we might have to wrap. Is there, is there any indication that crypto exchanges are possible? Crypto exchanges, profitability, they're enormously profitable. Uh, Coinbase did a, a, a venture round at an $8 billion valuation. Uh, uh, one crypto exchange has sold itself for $400 million. And CoinCheck, that lost the half a billion dollars of NEM, the 27-year-old who ran that in Japan, did not declare bankruptcy because he had already made over half a billion dollars in the previous 12 months. They are enormously profitable.